A day after the health official has announced the first case of Ebola diagnosed in the United States, there's a heightened sense of urgency about the epidemic. According to published reports, a second person in Dallas is now exhibiting Ebola symptoms, and a group of children is being monitored for possible exposure. This, as the director of the Centers for Disease Control, tries to tamp down fears of a widespread outbreak. My next guest says that response to the Ebola epidemic has been a gross failure from the very start. Nicholas Kristof is an op-ed columnist for The New York Times and a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. His new book, A Path Appears, co-written by his wife, Cheryl Wudun, is a kind of how-to guide for righting societal wrongs. Welcome. Pleasure to have you. Nicholas Thank you. Christoph. My pleasure. Looking forward to this. Just because you have written recently about Ebola, and now it seems to be sneaking into the right. United States. What could have been done to prevent what you now call a gross failure? Well, we know how to stop Ebola early on. I mean, this is something that we know from dealing with other infectious diseases and from dropping the ball on them, from dropping the ball on HIV, from dropping the ball on cholera in Haiti and others. And we indeed have a program that worked very well in Uganda to identify cases early on and stop the transmission. And so in Uganda, there was actually a case uh, that stopped with just one person getting uh, Ebola. That was not uh, the case in West Africa, and you know maybe that was understandable because there are a lot of other constraints. Mm -hmm. But this has been going on for, I mean, we're getting toward a year now, and if we had attempted early on, both the countries themselves and the international community, to stop this early, this could have been done with a modest investment of money, uh, many lives saved, and instead, when a disease, infectious disease, spreads out of control like this, it becomes infinitely harder to address. And, and, and as you point out, billions of dollars. Reading through your book, though, I, I, I sometimes I get this overwhelming sense of impending doom. I mean, I think a lot about you know all the disasters in Africa, especially on the women and children, which I'm glad right. you focused on that. I mean, everything from genital cutting to fistulas to the horrible situations with the cooking thing issues and that kind of thing. But I mean, is it really possible to take these things on? You address a few of them. Yeah. Like, there was a Emily, failure I'm with the optimist. cooking. Oh, my, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, you know, just addressing just, you know, even issues of childbirth. I mean, it just seems so overwhelming. Sure. But, the, but I have seen such real progress in my time. Uh, and, for example, um, when I first began to backpack around Africa as a law student, 1982, what really depressed me the most was blindness. So many middle-aged mm. people going blind unnecessarily, then having to pull kids out of school to lead them around. And this is something that um, uh, I've seen um, diminishing hugely. And, for example, one cause of blindness is trachoma. For 75 cents over three years, you can provide a medicine, azithromycin, which eradicates trachoma in that area. I saw a woman who had advanced trachoma for a $40 operation gave her her eyesight back. So when you see that, I mean, that is ultimately not depressing, mm -hmm. but inspiring well, and uplifting. And you talk about, like, for instance, deworming, which I knew nothing about. A lot of children in these third world countries need to be dewormed, and it costs pennies. But who comes up with it? Those countries don't. Um, no, but indeed, there too, there, you know, there is progress. More kids are getting dewormed. More kids are going to school. And I mean, the, the tragedy, though, is that we have the tools to solve these problems, but there isn't the political will either in the donor community or in those countries themselves. Everybody's kind of dropping the ball on this. And so, and we have the wrong metrics. For example, we focus on how many kids aren't going to school, but what we don't really look at is how many kids are going to mm -hmm. school and learning nothing around the world. So we can do a much better job, but there is improvement. One of the things I really liked was the kind of empowering of women, because let's face it, men still control the world, but <laughs> this whole thing about the savings and loan. And I, I, when I looked at the, the video that you did also, and I kept thinking, well, how does that work? And then I realized it's much simpler. I'm, my complex brain is thinking it's a regular bank, and you put the money in, and it grows. But it's not. It's like pennies into this lockbox. Into this lockbox, exactly. You know, one of the points we try to make in A Path Appears is that you know, sure, there are some high-tech solutions. There are some high-hanging fruit that we should pursue. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. <laughs> Simple things like helping people uh, save modest amounts of money. Or one intervention that would save 600,000 lives a year of babies is uh, optimal breastfeeding around the world. There's, in so many countries around the world, breastfeeding, um, you know, it begins too late. People are suspicious of colostrum. They give water to their babies. And this is something that is, you know, free, that is costless, with modest efforts to educate moms about how to 
breastfeed more successfully, 600,000 lives can be saved. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there, a lot of efforts to make a difference. And it does feel as if with some effort we can really get traction and push a lot farther. But even like with Ebola, is part of it because it is the African nations? Yes. That I, people go, ah, oh, they've got oh. so many problems, we can't save the world. I mean, if this were happening in Southern Europe, then obviously we would have acted very differently. And one of the things that I sometimes worry about, frankly, is that we in journalism, we cover planes that mm -hmm. crash. We cover countries that fail. And sometimes we leave the impression that Africa is this mm -hmm. collection of disasters. In fact, seven of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world are in Africa. But people, you know, that's not invariably the news we report. And so we have to figure out, and it's hard, how we can cover serious crises like Ebola, like Sudan, like Central African Republic, but also acknowledge to viewers that not only is there progress, but also there are ways to really make a difference and find traction through mm -hmm. issues like girls' education or empowering of women or micro-savings programs, the kind of things you're talking about that really do mm -hmm. transform communities. All right, well, I did get a little bit more optimism reading your book. Good, <laughs> good, thank you. All right, Nicholas Kristoff, pleasure to have you here. Delighted to be here.